Guys, this is huge. I have spent over six years trying to develop these ideas that will help you be successful in anatomy and physiology. And I have had a breakthrough. I have come up with 10 secret ideas that will help you see virtually every single concept of anatomy and physiology, or any healthcare course for that matter. Idea number one, structure fits function. Guys, this is literally the title of the course. Anatomy refers to the structure and physiology refers to the function. So if I were to ask you, what's the anatomy of this pillow? You may describe that it has these nice blue stripes, but it's mostly white, square with some tassels at the end, and it has a nice soft texture to it. But what's the function of this pillow? Well, it's to give a back support. It's for aesthetic or maybe for some entertainment. So you see the structures of this pillow determine the functions of the pillow. The same thing occurs with every structure of your body. Think about your teeth. Your incisors are very flat. That helps to cut and tear food. Your canines are more for puncturing, as well as gripping your food properly. And then you've got your premolars and molars in the back. These will help you grind up your food before you swallow it. But this idea can apply to microscopic structures as well. For example, you have cells in your body that send signals. These are called neurons. And there are neurons in your brain that have to send signals all the way down to your small intestine. That's a long ways. So these cells are structured in such a way where the signaling branch extends out multiple feet. Yeah, you have cells that are over three feet long. That's crazy. But then you have cells like your skin cells. And the ones you actually see are packed with proteins. And these protein structures help to insulate and protect your body from the outside environment. So as you're diving into diagrams and models and obscure structures and drawings of anatomy, think about why it's structured the way it is, because you can then infer what the function is. Structure fits function. Concept number two, homeostasis. You see, homeostasis means similar standing. And this means that your body likes to stay within a set point of a variety of different values. These values can be things like blood pressure, blood sugar or blood glucose, body temperature, blood pH. All of these are called homeostatic variables. These values must fall within a specific range. So for example, your blood pH needs to stay between 7.35 and 7.45 on the pH scale. If it drifts out of that, you could be in trouble and your body won't function properly. So think about homeostasis as like a thermostat. So how does a thermostat work? Well, you set your thermostat to a certain temperature, say 72 degrees, or if you live with your grandparents, more like 78. <laughs> Sorry, Grandma. And if your house gets too warm in the summer, as your home temperature raises to 73 or 74 degrees, what will kick on? Well, obviously your air conditioning. The air conditioning will turn on, blow cool air into your house, and bring that temperature back to the set point. And vice versa, in the winter, if your home drops below 72 degrees, your heater will turn on, raising it back to that set point. This is usually how your body maintains homeostasis. So to take an easy example, if you begin to get too hot, what does your body do? If you look at my armpits, you can probably tell. You begin sweating to cool your body off. And if you get too cold, your body might start to shiver to generate more heat to get that temperature back to the set point. And here's an important point. If your body is incapable of bringing itself back to that set point, you have a disease. So for example, if you are diabetic, you struggle regulating your blood sugar levels. Blood sugar is a homeostatic variable. And if you're a diabetic, you can't control your blood sugar levels very well. So therefore, you have a disease diabetes. So all of this leads me really well into concept number three. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. I'll need my dog Gracie to illuminate this point. Just about three months ago, this poor thing decided to tear her CCL. That's an ACL for a dog. And the ACL was torn on this back left leg. So when we went to the doctor to get it repaired, what did I not do? I didn't tell him to check her back right leg because the issue was her back left leg. So we focused our energy and attention to that back leg to get her better. And now she's running and jumping and basically taking over the house like normal again. So you see, your body has a bunch of squeaky wheels here and there. So let's take the example of body temperature. When your body temperature got too high, you began to sweat. And that sweat, that liquid on your skin, evaporated, taking some of your body heat with it, therefore cooling you off. So in that case, the squeaky wheel was your body temperature. And it got the grease, which was your sweat. But here's the trade-off. You couldn't sweat forever because eventually you just run out of body fluid. So you see, the body will pull from its storages to fix the biggest problem at hand. Say that again. Your body will pull from its own resources to fix the problem at hand. 
That is so important. So let's take another example. If you're infected by some sort of virus or bacteria, your body temperature will rise. And I'm just telling you that's not a good thing. But what's the squeaky wheel in that point? Your body's infected with a pathogen, a thing that could kill you. So in that case, you are going to raise your body temperature to attempt to fight that off at the expense of potentially damaging your body for being in a higher temperature state for a short period of time. So you see, whatever is the most, so you see, whatever is the, Im <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your body deems as the most important issue to fix, it will do everything to fix it first. So get some grease on that tire because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Concept number four, quick quiz. If you're a real estate agent, what is your main phrase? Location, location, location. And that's the same for your body too. You see, depending on the location of certain things and substances, they will act differently in a different location. What do I mean by that? Take epinephrine, for example. That's the chemical that is actually in an EpiPen. If epinephrine is injected into your bloodstream, it will exert a widespread effect on a variety of cell types, namely the muscles in your lungs to open them up so you can breathe again, as well as the heart to speed it up and contract harder. However, epinephrine is also the chemical signal that a neuron sends. Remember those signaling cells I talked about? And those neurons usually act on one very specific cell, whereas the epinephrine in your bloodstream will exert a widespread effect because your blood goes everywhere. Or concept number nine. So if you have sugar in your gut cavity, that's basically the tube of your intestines. You want that glucose, that sugar, to actually get into your cells because the cells use it as fuel to make energy. But the glucose is doing nothing for your cells, just sitting in the tube of your gut. So therefore, your body will try to draw that into the bloodstream to then get to the cell, to then use it for energy. The location of the glucose really mattered here, so keep that in mind as well. Another location that really matters is where the subscribe button is on your screen. And if this video has been helpful to you so far, I would love it if you were to drag your mouse down to that area, click the subscribe button, click the like button, and I will make more and more content to benefit you as a student. How's that for a segue? <laughs> oh, golly. Core concept number five. Things in nature like to flow from high to low. And I'm not just talking about gravity. You see, your body runs on what's called concentration gradients. That basically means that something is high in one area and relatively low in another area. Wow, it's like location matters again. If there's something densely concentrated in the high area and in low concentration in another area, it will want to move from the high to low concentration. That's called flowing down a concentration gradient. So in fact, this describes your entire respiratory system, basically your breathing system. When you bring in air into your lungs, there's a relatively high concentration of oxygen in the air and a relatively low concentration in your bloodstream. So therefore, the oxygen in the high concentration of the lungs wants to flow into the low concentration of the blood, Therefore, oxygen goes into your bloodstream to go to your cells to make energy. But there's a caveat. Sometimes they can't flow from high to low because there's a barrier, a barrier called the cell membrane. And if you want to learn more about the cell membrane, I encourage you to watch this video right here. It will be really beneficial for you to understand how cell membranes work, as well as how things flow between different areas of your cells. On to core concept number six. Core concept number six. Words matter. And not just in the sense of you using nice words to your annoying brother, but they really matter in anatomy and physiology. And therefore, spelling matters too. For example, the word ilium and the word ilium sound the same. One refers to a part of your small intestine, one refers to part of your hip bone. So therefore, if you're having surgery on your ilium, you better know which one it is. But more than that, usually the words in anatomy and physiology will tell you what they mean. Let me give you some examples. Foramen magnum. You see, foramen means whole. Magnum means big. So what is the foramen magnum? A big hole. And no, probably not the big hole you're thinking of. It's actually the big hole at the base of your skull. It's actually where your brain stem and your spinal cord are located through. So where did foramen, magnum, and all these other words come from? Usually Latin and Greek roots. You see, when all of these terms were being coined, they were usually coined in either Latin or Greek. And so I encourage you to go look up prefixes and suffixes, so beginnings of the words and the ends of the words, in Latin and Greek specifically for medical students. If I have made some resources of this, it'll be in the link in the description below. But if not, just go online, go to Google and just type in Latin roots or Latin prefixes and suffixes for medical students or for healthcare providers or for health nuts, whatever you are or will be. <laughs> 
And the more you memorize these root words, the more you will see them show up over and over and over again. So if you're not convinced, let me just give you a couple more examples. Epithelial. Epi refers to on top of. Philia usually refers to a sheet. Your epithelial cells, or your epithelial tissue, are basically the cells that form a sheet-like lining on your body. So if you touch any part of your body right now, it's likely epithelial tissue. Another one would be myosin. Myo refers to muscle. Usually when it ends in I-N, it's a protein, a protein that your cells have made. So literally it means muscle protein. It's the protein in your muscles that help contract your muscles. So anatomy is not hard, people. You just have to know your root words because words matter. Core concept number seven, no receptor, no change. You may have heard of the common phrase, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? The answer, drum roll, is yes, it does make a sound. But did anybody hear it? You see, there was a signal there. There was sound. But there is nobody there to receive the sound. And in your body, there are signals occurring all over the place. Whether they're in your bloodstream, whether they're in your neurons, whether they are coming from the external environment, there's signals everywhere. And in order for you to respond to those signals, you must have a receptor that's specifically structured to receive those signals. So for example, you have what's called photoreceptors. Photo meaning light, receptor obviously meaning to receive. Told you words matter. And those photoreceptors are found in one place and one place only in your body. You could probably guess where? In the back of your eye in your retina. So these neurons, these signaling cells have receptors on them that actually receive photons of light. When they receive those light particles, they will send signals to the brain about what you're seeing. Now, if you are permanently blind because because you don't have a retina, light is still coming into your eyes, but you don't have the receptor for them. Therefore, you can't see. The same can happen for basically any sort of hormone or endocrine disorder, as well as any other disorder where there's not a receptor to receive the signal. I have to tell you a story for this one. I was sitting on the couch one day and I was working on work because I work normally. <laughs> And my beautiful wife was cooking dinner in the kitchen just about 10 steps away from me. I had my headphones in listening to Mozart, of course, because that's like a productive thing to do. And little to my knowledge, she was asking me for help in the kitchen. However, I couldn't hear her. So since I couldn't hear her, I couldn't make the change necessary to go and help her and to make her happy, which is my goal in life, right? And the same thing happens in your body. If your cells, the functional unit of your body, don't have receptors for certain signals, you won't be able to receive or perceive those signals. Commandment number eight, use it or lose it. You can probably think of some general examples of how if you don't use something in your body, you'll likely lose it. So for example, if you don't use your muscles very much, they are likely going to atrophy or break down, get smaller, get weaker, you know, as well as things in your brain. If you think about certain things, it's more likely that you are going to think about them again. Whereas if you don't think about certain things, you're probably not going to use those pathways. Therefore, you're going to lose those pathways. But more specifically, on the microscopic level, Level, your cells are incredibly adaptable. In fact, in most addiction states, you're using that drug or phone or cigarette or something so many times that your brain is just hardwired to go to that every single time. And on the cellular level, the cells actually have stronger and stronger and more and more receptors for whatever that stimulus is, whether it's some sort of opioid hit, what have you. At the same time, eventually, if you stop using it, you will likely lose that addiction. I use this example in my class all the time, the power of positive thinking. You see, the more you think about and reframe different situations in a positive light, the more you feel better generally as a whole. And that's because you're using these pathways a lot, so you're keeping those pathways strong. And at the same time, you're losing the pathways that make you more pessimistic, more negative about situations. Core concept number nine, your blood is a river of life. You see, you are made of 30 trillion needy cells. Each of those cells need some sort of blood supply in order to stay alive. If they don't get the nutrients from the bloodstream, they will eventually die. So therefore, a lot of those homeostatic variables I was talking about earlier, like blood pressure, blood glucose, blood pH, aren't by accident. Whatever gets into your blood bathes your cells, whether good or whether bad. And that's one reason that drugs are administered through IVs a lot of the times, or orally, because eventually that's gonna get into the bloodstream and go everywhere. So the reason you breathe, the reason you eat, the reason you drink water is all to get those things into the bloodstream to then get them to the cells so they can use them for whatever the heck they need to do. Whether it's make energy, whether it's make proteins, or other cell activities that we'll talk about in the cell biology unit. Now on to the last and final, and I would say most important commandment. You see, you always have to save the best for last.
Commandment number 10, Psalm 139. You see, as a Christian, I believe that our bodies were intricately woven together by God. In fact, we were made in the very image of God, the Imago Dei. And in Psalm 139, it speaks to the amazing intricacies of our bodies. So let me read it for you. Verse 13 through 14. For it was you, God, who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. You see, in order to understand our bodies better, I think we have to have this humble reverence of how truly incredible they are. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We have 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our bodies. We have more connections in our brain than there are stars in the night sky. Every second, your body does 360 billion times a billion chemical reactions to keep you alive. And in my opinion, that just shows the amazing intricacies and knowledge of the God we serve. So therefore, we should approach this subject matter in joy and expectation and awe, praising God for the ability to even study this subject and then using that knowledge for good. Whether it's to go be a nurse and doctor to help heal people or if it's just to heal yourself and your family, I think it all stems from this awe that we should have of our bodies because we are fearfully and wonderfully made.